recording. Hi, everybody. Welcome to season three of The Matrix, Conversations and Transformations, a seminar and podcast series from the Department of Critical Theory and Social Justice in Los Angeles. I'm Malik Moazam Dorlat, and I'm joined by the co-organizers of The Matrix, Professors Mary Christianakis and Professor Caroline Heldman, as well as the organizer of this ballroom series, CTSJ Professor Claire Crawford. Today, we are excited to be joined by activist and artist, Sean Milan Garcon, the legendary Sean Milan Garcon. Before Professor Crawford introduces us, a quick overview of The Matrix and what's still coming up in our third season. So just broadly, The Matrix focuses on pressing current events, and our goal is to connect our community with innovative experts, scholars, artists, and the most effective activists in the areas of critical theory and social justice. We've wrapped up our indigeneity and settler colonialism series and our fighting white supremacy and global ethno-nationalism series for the semester. This episode is the final installment of our ballroom series, but we still have episodes coming up in um, our discussions of technologies of repression and resistance in the Middle East, North Africa, and among Muslim groups. And we'll have a, an episode coming up on April 1st, same time, noon, uh, where we'll discuss, we'll have a panel discussion about the persecution of Uyghurs in China with Professor Timothy Gross and president of the Muslim Public Affairs Council, Salam al Mariyadi. So just so everyone knows, we're using the webinar format. And in case, you know, a year in, we still aren't familiar with it. There's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen towards the right. If you click on that and type your question, we'll be able to see it. That's it. Thank you very much. And I'm going to turn this over to Professor Crawford. Uh, it is my honor to introduce the legendary Sean Milan Garçon. He is a performance artist, advocate, and one of the pioneering founders of the West Coast house and ballroom scene. Sean has constructed programs that bridge artistic creation, HIV education, and wellness development for queer and trans youth of color in LA. This includes founding and producing the annual Ovenus Ball, the longest running ball on the West Coast for the past 14 years. His latest achievement is as founder of the nonprofit, The House of Ought, whose mission is to facilitate young people working side by side uh, with professional artists to gain free studio training in various art forms, including dance and choreography, audio slash video production, fashion design, music production, and street art. The organization is based around an individualized artist development model to help each young person create a finished work that they can share with the community and use for future professional opportunities. For more info, definitely reach out to the House of Odd by visiting thehouseofodd.org. Sean Milan has also served as an artist and resident at the Whitney Museum of the American Art in New York City in conjunction with painter Laura Owen's mid-career retrospective. Through his performance and advocacy work, Sean Milan has partnered with a variety of institutions, including Macy's, 356 uh, South Mission Gallery, the Box Gallery Museum of Contemporary Art in LA, Alliance for California Traditional Arts, City of West Hollywood Arts Commission, USC, UCLA, Occidental College, Cal State Long Beach, Elizabeth Taylor AIDS Foundation, World of Wonder, LA Pride, and Downtown LA Pride. So thank you, Sean, uh, for being here with us first to start <laughs> us off. <laughs> You've done so much. Uh, I guess like just to get into it, you can tell us more about yourself and how you get into ballroom. Okay, so thank you for having me. Um, I really, really appreciate this opportunity. Yes, it's been a lot of different things. I mean, like I was explaining earlier, um, I just kind of do the work um, and I kind of move on from one project to the next. Um, and just to even hear you read all of that uh, is just kind of a bit overwhelming for me. So again, thanks for having me. Um, how I actually got into ballroom is a very interesting story. Uh, I actually um, started voguing probably in 1992 or became interested in voguing in 1992. Um, I was I was a uh, pretty much underage uh, teen um, sneaking into different various you know uh, underground clubs and whatnot here in Los Angeles, um, the Horizon being mainly one of them. Uh, and there was this amazing guy who was actually voguing, um, and I was like, "What is he doing? And you know, why is he not dancing like everybody else?" And he was just a phenomenal voguer. Um, and so I was like, "I really want to get into this, you know, the presentation, all of that kind of stuff, right?" So it was really interesting because I, you know, after a couple of weeks of seeing him out and whatnot, um, I finally like approached him to speak with him and, you know, see if he would, you know, be interested in teaching me how to Vogue and all that, or how can I learn this and where does this come from and blah, 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 right? Um, and the crazy part about it was, was that he started signing to me, right? Because he was actually deaf. 
right? Um, or he was actually, yeah, so he was like deaf mute. So he could actually speak, um, but he could not hear, right? His name was William Byrd and he was actually one of the stars in a very, a movie, a very powerful movie um, that was out a long time ago called uh, Children of a Lesser God. And he was one of the main stars of the movie. Um, and so um, we would, he would be able to read my lips. So we were able to actually communicate and whatnot. And I was like, well, how are you doing this amazing dance? And really, you know, all, you know, just executing all the moves to perfection and whatnot. Um, and you can't, you know, you, you can't hear like everyone else can, you know, hear the music and everything. And what he, what he explained to me was a very important lesson. He said, when people dance, they don't dance to the music. They dance to, they don't dance to, the, you know, like the music, they dance to what they feel, right? And he said, as long as my feet are planted on the ground, I can feel the vibrations of the movement, I mean, of the music, therefore, um, you know, execute be, being, you know, I'm able to execute these particular moves or whatnot, right? Which I thought was so amazing, right? And when you think about voguing and and you know its origins and whatnot, it is basically it's definitely based upon a feeling, right? So he was one of the prime examples of someone who actually lived that. Um, and unfortunately, he passed away several years ago. Um, but his teachings and his methods, his methodology around um, voguing and performance and, and the ballroom scene and all that kind of stuff has always stuck with me, you know, throughout my entire life or whatnot. So, yeah, so probably like around 92, you know, playing around, voguing and all that kind of stuff, getting the hard lessons, you know, um, you know, when people started, you know, voguing in Los Angeles, you know, you would have these kind of like mentor type folks who had been around the country had seen voguing and had seen balls and all of that. Um, and they would basically just kind of like force you to vogue or call you out like on the dance floor, you know what I mean? So you kind of were like forced to have to, you know, battle and vogue and, and just really present, you know? Um, so yeah, so, you know, after a couple of years of doing that, um, I really started traveling to other coasts and I traveled to DC um, where I happened to meet, um, I was visiting a best friend out there and I happened to meet one of the, um, uh, folks that were uh, that's on um, Paris is Burning, uh, Kenny Munya Ebony, uh, right? And one of his first times walking in drag was in Paris is Burning. Um, he was just telling me about, you know, uh, the ball scene and oh my God, you have to be a part of the ball scene because I was always a fashion kind of kid, you know, um, not always in the best fashion, but I always had style, right? And I always feel like, you know, style is something you're born with. Fashion, you can buy off a rack, but you're always born with style, right? So I was always kind of stylish and, you know, I'm into the Gautier and Versace and all of that kind of stuff. So him just really explaining the ballroom scene was kind of like a situation where it was like, oh, wow, there's a place for me, right? You can wear your cute clothes, you can do your little dancing and voguing and do all those kinds of things. Um, and at the time, I really just thought that's all it was. Um, and so throughout the entire summer, I actually you know, spent time in DC with Kenny Munya Ebony and my friend Tracy. Um, and he basically took us to New York for like gay pride where, you know, um, they kind of pseudo inducted me into the house of Ebony. That was like one of my first houses or whatnot. But again, I still was a little, not as knowledgeable as I am now, of course, um, with what the scene was about. But as the years went on, you know, as you know, I gradually started to learn more, um, you know, became a lot more visible and all of that. But yeah, I really basically started from, you know, it was just basically kind of friends, you know, doing it, all of that. And um, yeah, here we are today. <laughs> uh, thank you for sharing that story for sure. I guess like the, to follow up just before we get more into West Coast Ballroom, I want you to explain to us titles in Ballroom and why you are the legendary Sean Milan. And I remember you told me that you were going soon to be iconic. Uh, hopefully right yes, you know. uh, hopefully. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's been a long time and I'm just like okay hopefully it's going to happen soon um you know these bones are getting kind of old I'm actually like it's it's really you know surreal to me I'm actually turning 50 in June so mm -hmm. people are just like you've really been around a really really long time but there are a lot of different um, factors that tie into different titles. So um basically I mean I guess starting off you know there's uh what we would actually call a statement um, which is a young person who is actually in the ballroom scene and not necessarily a young person, just a person in, who's new to the ballroom scene, but it's definitely, again, making a statement, right? Someone that you're seeing at different balls and like, oh, wow, this person, you know, that just those, you know, those people that just kind of stand out in the crowd, you know, and or they stand out for walking a particular category or whatnot. Those are usually called statements, right? Um, and then you also have stars, which are people who are a little bit more than a statement. Um, they are now becoming into their own. You're starting to really know what their name is. Um, you know, they are creating a, you know, a really great uh, reputation as far as performance wise or their contrib contribution to the community. So you, you know, 
that's where the uh, the uh, star comes in, right? And so then there is there's legendary, right? And so legendary, ideally, you know, there are a lot of different criteria when it comes to be uh, someone becoming legendary, um, and there's always a lot, oftentimes, a lot of discussion as to whether or not um, somebody is legendary for this or whether they're legendary for that, right? And so it'll be like, okay, well, you know, this person is really active in community involvement and activism and all these kinds of things, or there'll be this person is really great at runway, but runway is really the only time that you actually see them within the community, right? Or you see them at a ball walking runway, right? So there's always been this debate going back and forth. And I find myself getting kind of lost in that whole uh, political slash sliding scale of who is legendary, who is an icon, all of that, right? Because legendary, ideally, you've been around for quite some time. Uh, there used to be a standard where it was like, you know, if you're walking your, your category consistently for like 10 years, um, Ideally, you would become legendary, and 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 when ballroom was you know really starting and really getting hot, the thing about it was that if you were legendary, you could deem someone else legendary, right? But when we're talking about these sliding scales and whatnot, now it's become this point of there are these committees, and there may be an East Coast committee or a West Coast committee, and so on, so on. Do they feel like you are actually you know um, worthy of this particular title and? I mean, some committees, they even ask for resumes and whatnot and, you know, and what have you done for us to support you, you know, throughout the nation and, and blah, 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 right? So I have definitely, I have been, I, I mean, I've been a, I've been a um, legendary since 2000, 2006, right? Um, I was deemed legendary uh, by a former uh, ballroom participant uh, by the name of uh, Father Taz Ultra Omni. Um, and it was right when I had started producing the balls for um, Reach LA, which was in 2006, right? Um, so I did, a, I did a performance at that particular uh, function. And yeah, uh, he deemed me legendary then. He said, I have something special for you. I'm going to be announcing you as legendary and blah, 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 and all that kind of stuff, right? So what ended up happening was, was Tobias ended up Taz Ultra Omni. He ended up leaving the scene and pursuing other things in his life, right? Some people stay in the scene. Some people, you know, they come and they go or whatnot. But he had definitely made a really huge contribution as far as the West Coast was concerned. So his words were valuable at the time, right? Um, so then here we go, maybe about four or five, maybe even six years later, um, when the committees started coming into play in, on the West Coast and that type of thing. Um, and then they were like, okay, well, we as a committee officially see you as a legend, right? Because there was all this conversation. I'm like, look, I have videos of him calling me out as legendary, da 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 da, da. And they're still like, well, we want to have this committee and we want to, you know what I mean? And all, and all this kind of stuff, right? And I've never been one about um, battling over who it is that I am. Like I said, I just do the work. I keep my head down um, and I keep my mission, you know, I keep my mission in my focus, right? So if, as long as I'm helping other young and black and brown LGBTQIA um, artists and even those who are, are, are non-artists, you know, as long as I'm helping the young folks, I'm whatever you want to call me, call me, right? <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't really have this particular thing. Like, you know, um, yes, I am legendary. Um, and then what ended up happening was, was that, um, things just kept going, you know, time would just stretch out. So it was like, you know, I was working for Reach LA for 14 years, producing like one of the largest balls on the West Coast. And, you know, it's like, okay, well, he's still not an icon. You know, people were asking questions, especially the younger generations who are now defining what these terms mean in different ways, not discrediting those who have already, who have come before us or who are, you know, who were uh, named as icons and legends and whatnot, you know, they're st the standards were very different. So uh, what started happening now is this trend of people calling me iconic, right? Because they're like, well, if the groups and the, and the, and the um, committees aren't really, you know, justifying you becoming an icon, what definitely the work that you've done within the community is iconic and the things that you do are definitely iconic, right? So I'm kind of cool with iconic because for me, that actually, that, that speaks to actions as opposed to just speaking of, okay, well, this person is an icon for runway or this person is an icon for best dressed or, or, you know, or one of the trans folks being iconic as well. You know, I do a lot of different things and the mission is always to uplift the house and ballroom community. So yeah, it just, it, it, again, you know, I just kind of fell in this kind of weird kind of crazy place and people were like, well, why haven't we heard of you? You know, having found it one of the first houses on the West Coast, um, you know, people are like, well, you know, on the East, it's like, well, why haven't we heard of you? But then my, you know, my argument to that oftentimes is, is that, well, there are a lot of icons that are actually um, from, you know, the East Coast that we have not seen on this particular coast, right? And so, you know, it becomes this kind of, 
you know, LA against, you know, or East versus West and all of that. And to me, it really just doesn't matter. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't go around discrediting what other folks have done within the scene. And I just ask that people don't do that to me, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, thank you for that. I guess like to just build off what you were saying, like how does ballroom come to rise and gain that legitimacy on the West Coast um, in comparison, I guess, to the East Coast? Well, okay, so the East Coast has something that we didn't necessarily have on the West Coast, and that was consistency. They have way more people, right? <laughs> they have way more venues. They have way more functions. They'll have like at least, you know, maybe five, you know, to 10 functions, at, especially when ballroom was really, really, you know, popular and whatnot um, in, the, in the 80s and 90s. They were just having functions like all the time. Um, and we're on the West Coast, it's not as much. And we're very Hollywood paparazzi, you know what I mean? And so, excuse me, oh, my sinuses. But yeah, we were, um, you know, it's like on the East Coast, uh, they have, you know, it's just a more regular thing. And it started there, right? So the way that the West Coast ballroom scene was built, it was really built on the inspiration of that. But at the same time, we still had to kind of find our own way and our own kind of uh, methods of doing things, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, I don't know if I answered your question, but uh, the, that difference had a really big um, impact because of the fact that, you know, again, when you're giving a ball and whatnot, first of all, if you don't have, if you, you know, I was very fortunate in finding people around me um, that really wanted to support the work that I was doing. And so I was able to find that, that particular support like in Reach LA and whatnot when they wanted to actually give a function um, because the CDC was basically saying that you know the house and ballroom community um, was one of the most underserved communities when it came to sexual education and sexual health and all of that, especially with the HIV you know, um, epidemic and all of that going on. Um, and so I was able to step outside of myself and find that support for our community, right? But normally what happens if you're an individual and you're trying to give a ball, you really have to put all that money up front for yourself. You know, you got to have those coins. And if you don't got the coins, then you know what I mean? And it's a very thankless kind of um, venture uh, financially because you know you are basically putting up your money and you may just break even right <laughs> you may not make a profit and all that and most of the time you don't make a profit because you're thinking about prize money and and venue spaces and DJs and and all of those types of things so yeah um basically you know um I'm I, see I told you I'll get lost and I'll just get lost in the thought of it all because it is <laughs> because it is so much but um it's 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 thrilling it's fun it's all of those kinds of things but yeah the way that we actually differ is the fact is that we were based upon an inspiration of ballroom um and we kind of had to make our own rules and not necessarily when I say rules I mean we had to kind of just figure out our own way as to how many how often we should be having functions what functions should be looking like all of that but it was a it was a really long time coming in the development of all of that a nuts and bolts question uh, about uh, who get who has access to planning balls. How much do they cost? How has that shifted over time? What's the what's the fundraising model? Okay, so there really isn't a fundraising model, right? Because ideally, you know, a person would just say, "Hey, I'm this person. I have a name in the community, and I want to give a ball," right? But you definitely have to be someone who is a part of the house and ballroom community or noted in the house and ballroom community in order for people to even pay attention to your function, right? Um, you also have to be able to call on, you know, the different judges and whatnot, which are other notable people in the house and ballroom community who are actually, you know, qualified with the different categories in order to be able to judge. Um, you know, the contestants or the walkers as we would call them, right? So yeah, so the funding raising and all that is really up to the actual individual, right? And after giving a couple of balls prior to me working at Reach LA, um, you know, I was like, I really need to find some kind of funding stream or some kind of funder um, that would actually, you know, be on board with this um, or who was actually working in alignment with the same things that we were trying to do within community. So yeah, nuts and bolts, it can be very, very expensive, you know, um, if you don't have the support of, uh, of community uh, businesses, all, you know, city, your local cities, all of those types of things, right? And before when ball started, you really didn't have that. So a lot of times there were little hole in the wall places and they just had a little PA system or something and they, you know, they did what they had to do. Nowadays, um, you know, you find there's a lot of organizations and whatnot, and um, even uh, museums and 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 uh, 
you know, big arts institutions that are now willing to invest in those types of um, ventures. Um, and I say those types of ventures because there's a lot that goes into it. You know, there's a big difference between an, you know, produ producing or putting together an underground community level event as opposed to a, a major financed event from a major funder, right? Because there's a lot of legalities, there's a lot of things that go on in underground ballroom that don't necessarily, that are not, not necessarily allowed, you know, in mainstream or, you know, by law, so to speak, <laughs> if I can just be clear and honest, right? Um, so you definitely have to know the difference between the two. Um, and again, have a reputation where people are just, they, the people really trust you, not only with their funding and whatnot, but with their reputations um, you know, outside of ballroom as well. Thank you. Yes, I, uh, I was like, did somebody freeze? <laughs> oh, no, no, you're good. Uh, I guess to like follow up on that, um, you're founder of the Openness Ball. And so how have you included the work of HIV education with the ball? Uh, okay, so um, I was 35 years old when I got my first HIV test, right? Um, which is a very long time. I was one of those people who, you know, if I didn't know, I didn't want to know, right? I was like, okay, well, nothing's happened thus far and I don't know, so I don't want to know and blah, blah, blah. Um, but what a lot of people didn't know is that I actually have a brother who passed away um, due to complications of AIDS. He actually died of leukemia, but um, he had HIV and whatnot. Um, and so he passed away, but he, it was like a very long time ago. And I kind of just, that's what kind of molded my whole idea of, I don't want to know, like, ah, uh, you know what I mean? Like, um, this is really heavy, um, but uh, I don't know, something happened. When I turned 35, I took my first HIV test and whatnot, and uh, my test was actually negative, and I was really excited and all that, and I was like, well, what could I do to um, really you know, spread awareness about HIV, how important it now, how, how I now feel it's important to be tested and knowing is better than not knowing, um, and so um, it's really interesting. I was actually going to school as a massage therapist, Right, and there was a friend of mine who uh, his name was Tyrone Carter, and he was working for an organization called Reach LA. Um, and I had already been in the ballroom scene for quite some time. And he was like, "Well, you know, you're probably one of those people. You're one of those people in the community that has kind of like that. You're, you're in that middle ground. You know, I kind of like am on the fence. You know, some people like me, some people don't like me, some people love me, some people don't love me. But at the same time, everyone has respect for me. In the, in the, if that makes sense." Um, and so they respect my, you know, and they respect my reputation within the scene. Um, and so, um, you know, he came to me, he said, yeah, hey, this, you know, this thing has come down from the CDC. We'd love to give a ball. You know, we have some kids here who want to give a ball. Da, da, da. Would you, you know, help us actually put it together? Um, and so I actually uh, went in, you know, I met Martha Chono Helsley. Um, again, my friend Tyrone Carter was there. And then I met Carla Gordon, who works with me now um, with the House of Art. Uh, and so, you know, we had a conversation about it. I said, okay, well, let me just start putting some things, some ideas together and whatnot. You know, I came up with the name of the Ovenus Ball because there was a house called the House of Ovenus um, back in the day. And I just thought that it was the most amazing house in the world. And I was like, well, let's do the Ovenus Ball. But Ovenus had also, be, oh, the word Ova had also been, you know, been like a slang term for quite some time and whatnot. And so um, the way that we would spell it was O-V-A-H. The House of Ovenus was spelled O-V-A-N-E-S-S. -O -S -S, and then we did O-V-A-H-N-E-S-S -S to really refer to that, you know, um, that slang term, so to speak. Um, and so, yeah, so they called me in to do it um, in 2006. And then from 2006 to what was it, 2019, um, you know, I was just, you know, producing the Ovenus Ball. But the HIV education, oh yeah. So the education, what happened was, as I was working at Reach LA, Reach LA is an HIV, um, a youth HIV H, um, education um, organization, right? So along with working with um, Reach, I was working with them for like six months, like volunteering and just learning different things and whatnot. And so through that process, I was able to actually take different courses on HIV training. And, and, and um, I'm, you know, I am a certified tester and counselor for the County of Los Angeles as well. Another hat, right? <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, so I just basically, um, you know, just learned different courses and all those kinds of things. And I just really felt it was important. Um, you know, I used to tell the kids all the time, in order to walk, you have to, you have to be able to walk, right? So in order to be able to walk a ball, it's really important for you to actually know what's going on with your health. Here, everybody, you know, you know, I, I let everybody know, you know, um, 
whether you know you're HIV positive or not, it really doesn't matter. I mean, we still all need to know what's going on with us health wise. Um, and also too, um, aside from what's going on with us health wise, we are still valuable people, right? And we still have valuable talents. We still have valuable assets and really focusing on what you feel is valuable about yourself is what's going to help you get through all of the other stuff. And so that's, it just kind of became a model um, to, to really quite be honest with you. Um, and it was a natural thing for me um, because it just made sense. There was not a lot of red tape involved and all of that. Um, you know, we'll get the CDC says this or the so and so says that. And it's like, well, what do you say to yourself as an individual? And I feel like that's the most important part about it. Can I just um, follow up with that in the current context of COVID-19? Um, I know COVID-19 has been uh, really scary for people with HIV. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how that's played into your work and what have been the implications for the ballroom community in this regard? Well, what has been great about my, um, you know, my time, you know, in the in the in the HIV field as well as the ballroom, um, the thing about it is, is that young people, um, as long as they have access, or they understand um, the the. Um, the 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 process of, of gaining access um, to these different services. Um, we have worked really really hard at Reach to make sure that people actually um, were able to access services. And then a lot of organizations started following along in that same process, really understanding how to communicate with ballroom folks and 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 get them to a point where they feel comfortable themselves and know that they should, when they go to certain places, there's there should be a level of cultural competency. That has been a really big, big thing um, in my entire career of um, working in the HIV field with, you know, and, and working with various organizations, right? So, um, Access and all of that, I feel like it's been a little bit more difficult just because of COVID or whatnot, but not impossible. You know, and I've, and you know, I always hold young people um, accountable for um, being proactive, especially when it comes to their health and whatnot. You know, there's not a young person that I do not know that know that that feels like they can't call me and be like, Sean, hey, you know what I mean? I'm 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 thinking about going through even the process of transition, or I'm you know I need HIV medications. Who can I go to? And I can pick up the phone and be like, hey, we'll call so-and-so at, at the LGBT center. You know, my sister's assistant lab manager at the LGBT center, which is amazing, right? Um, she really um, uh, looks up to me a lot. And it was really cool that she decided to actually take that particular career path. Um, she's kind of like legendary as well um, in the scene just for being my sister. Um, and actually she has a lot of relationships, especially personal relationships with folks um, who actually access services at the LGBT center, who I know, but don't necessarily know their statuses and whatnot, if that makes sense, right? Um, so for us, you know, we've been surviving for quite some time in ballroom um, and navigating life and it's, you know, it's challenges. Uh, so this is really, you know, it's been a, a little difficult because you can't really access things in, in person. Um, but at the same time, these, org you know, there are a lot of organizations, like I said, Reach LA, the LGBT Center, um, the Unique Women's Coalition, uh, Trans Wellness Center, you know, all of those places have really been, you know, being out, oh, APAIT as well. Um, they have really been working hard to, uh, you know, be there for folks during this particular time. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, just to, uh, I guess, uh, piggyback off of that, thinking about your work with youth and how the House of Odd comes to be, can you tell us more about that? Right. So um, I have been working at REACH for, again, in this, and, you know, we started the, the House of Odd on, uh, in February of 2020, which was crazy because we're like, oh my God, pandemic, you know, um, we had all this programming and whatnot. So just to explain what the organization is. Um, so it's the House of Art um, and it's spelled A-W-T. Um, it's pronounced art, like art, darling. We took a real snobby, you know, kind of, you know, it's all about the art, that kind of situation. Um, but we spell it A-W-T and it really stands for artists working together, right? Um, and so after working at REACH LA for many years, I'm doing, you know, uh, working, you know, in the HIV field and testing and all of that. Um, I had gotten to a point where I really um, wanted to focus specifically on the art, 
right? We, you know, I felt like there was a, a huge group of community members that we had gotten into care, access services, all of that. Um, and I really felt like art was where I wanted to really excel. And I felt that's where young folks would actually excel, just really teaching them how to use their artistic talents in order to make a self-sustainable life for themselves. And um, because especially when COVID hit, you know, it's like, where are these artists working and how can they do this and how can they do that? So we did a, 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 a a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of um, different community arts projects, you know, working with the city of West Hollywood, working with Macy's, all of that. Um, and again, uh, allowing young people to be not only access care and HIV, but also being able to be visible and recognized for their particular talents, right? Because of course, we all know that there is a huge disparity, um, especially when it comes to color um, within like the art world or when it comes to access to arts education and those types of things, right? But these are young people who are sitting around with amazing talents, they're God-given talents, and they're like, what do I do with them? How do I utilize them? How do I get people to see me? Right. Um, and because uh, I've been so fortunate to be able to, you know, sit in the room with so many different types of people, you know, well, you know, from world renowned artists to, you know, local community artists, um, you know, the whole gamut, whether it be, you know, professors, owners of research companies, all these different things, I was just like, how can I actually pull all this together and really focus on what I love the most, right? And art is that thing. Um, and that is the, the thing that has actually helped me to survive through my struggles and whatnot. Um, and, I'm, and I see it still happening for the young folks that I work with as well. Um, so just being able to give them that particular visibility. So I was like, hey, why don't we take some of the world renowned folks and some of the local community folks and mash them all together, put them on the same even playing field and let's do collaborative work together in a way that everyone can get the same type of visibility, right? And then also have access to the same type of opportunities, the same type of education, even though they may come from you know various different backgrounds, so that's how we kind of started the whole situation. Um, and so um, I was in when I was in New York working with um, Laura Owens. You know, she simply just asked me. She said, you know, Sean. She said, you know, you've done all these amazing things, whatever. What's next? And so I really basically gave her the concept of the House of Art and what I wanted to do. And she said, you know what? I'm really gonna I'm gonna help you. And so she said, I'm gonna help you. And the next thing I knew, you know, we have other artists and, and world renowned artists helping us and whatnot. Um, and then I have a very, you know, I don't give myself a lot of credit. I have a very long, I, what, what we call like back from the, you know, back in the day, I have a huge Rolodex of people to my disposal that I can just really literally pick up the phone because I've never been one of those people that do like uh, business cards and, and oh, what's your LinkedIn and all that. It's like, no, honey, what's your number? We can, you know, we can talk on the phone. I know there are crazy people in the world. If you don't want to talk to me, you can block me. Or if I don't want to talk to you, I can block you as well. But what is your number, you know, and creating those kinds of personal relationships is what I also teach young folks, um, you know, uh, as, as a way for them to actually get all, get away from the red tape and all of that. You know what I mean? Because people want to know you. They want to know your story. They want to they want to understand, you know, where exactly it is you're coming from. And then people also do want to know how they can help. Because oftentimes we just, oh, we want people to help us, but they don't know how to help. You know what I mean? And it could be someone sitting right next to you that could really just change your entire life. Um, and so Laura Owens was very, very instrumental in that particular um, part of, you know, starting starting the organization and just really getting me, um, it, you know, uh, getting, you know, just getting me into the focus of, of, again, having even my own organization at this point, you know, um, and again, being able to uh, work in a way that I feel uh, is best for the community and the, and the folks that I work with. So how have you been able to maintain that community being that you started this like at the beginning of the pandemic? So how are you creating this community with young folks? Well, okay, so again, my reputation is pretty cool. Uh, I, I, I am very, very grateful for that. Um, so people have always known me for doing very innovative and very creative um, uh, collaborations. Um, and I really don't, I really don't say no to much. <laughs> I'm starting to find as I'm reflecting, you know, have been able to sit back and reflect during COVID um, that, yeah, there was, there's a lot to reflect on. Um, and so, you know, um, 
but really it's just based upon you know my reputation with people i really have to just be quite honest it's it's about my reputation um it's really about um getting involved and really caring about people and putting myself you know uh second sometimes uh it can be a little detrimental you know it can be a little bad but um you know oftentimes i find myself putting you know the needs of other people um especially young people who may need help um before my own um, and I'm not a saint, you know, I'm not perfect, but, you know, but at the same time, uh, it's just kind of been a model of mine. Um, and people know that, you know, um, I usually do everything that I can and put 100% into helping other people. Um, so, yeah, uh, it's just one of those things, you know, and then, you know, people start talking, you know, I mean, you, you know, I, I was able to meet you, Claire, through, you know, Adrian or whatnot. And Adrian was my assistant for some time at Reach LA. Um, and yeah, you know, I mean, people talk and it's just kind of like word of mouth and it kind of just spreads and whatnot. Um, so, yeah. That's how I've been able to maintain it. You know, I'm, I'm just pick up the phone. Hey, I heard you were doing a new, you know, you have a new song out, you know, would you like to do some kind of spotlight or da, 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 you know what I mean? Like all that kind of stuff. I'm just kind of really seeing the needs and um, being proactive in helping. It, it, um, just to follow up on the collaboration idea that really varied, you know, really interesting, different kinds of collaborations. I saw that you um, had a collaboration not only at the Whitney, did, you know, they had a show at the Whitney, uh, which is amazing. I'd love to hear about that, but with the LA Philharmonic, um, right? Could you tell us a little bit about that and, how, and what that looked like and what you thought of it in the end? Yeah, so basically um, I was contacted by them because they were doing a series uh, called Movement Matters. Um, and again, someone who had knew about my work, my previous work, um, working at Reach and and whatnot, um, and then my work as you know as an, as an artist. I'm a you know I'm a I'm a um, a multifaceted artist, so to speak. I do visual arts, I do music, I do all different kinds of things. Like I just love to create. Period. Right. Um, whether I am fantastic and amazing at all those things, I guess that would be up to the critics. But at the same time, it has afforded me a lifestyle um, that I pretty much can navigate on my own. Right. Um, and so, yeah, so they contacted me. They said, we're doing this whole thing about Movement Matters. We're actually, um, we really want to focus on like the 80s and 90s with voguing and all of that. Um, and so I, you know, I, I provided them with some clips and whatnot um, of different, you know, of different balls and whatnot. And we just basically did an interview process or whatnot. But again, um, being, it's really interesting because it's always bittersweet being like a, a um, a, uh, like one of the pioneering founders, so to speak, right? Because yes, I have been here from the beginning um, and there are a lot of people who feel like that's a big deal, but then it's like within community, it's kind of like, oh yeah, he's all right. Oh yeah, he's gonna do something else. He's doing something else fantastic. He's doing something amazing. And then I have you here now saying like, oh my God, how did you get connected with them? You know, um, again, it's just been through doing the work, right? And I just put my, to be honest with you, I just put my head down. I don't have how half these things happen. It's not like I'm going out proactively and saying, please, you know, interview me and please, you know, show this and show that, you know, um, I even have a hard time doing that on social media and bragging about myself, right? Um, but yeah, it was just basically, again, word of mouth and you really need to check him out. You really need to hear, you know, his story and whatnot. Because most of the time when people, once people hear my story, um, you know, it's a, it, it, I, I say it's a wrap, you know what I mean? It's just like, okay, I've told my story again and now I'm opening up a whole floodgate of opportunities. Uh, and it's it, that's just what happened. I guess to like kind of save the, the best for last kind of conversation, I know you had a lot of opinions on this, is thinking about Hollywood's taking up ballroom and how we see it in reality TV shows. I think you said something interesting I hadn't thought about when we originally talked about uh, competitions, competitions, reality competitions, mimicking, right. you know, ballroom spaces, yeah. Yeah, so my whole take on everything is everything that you see on a reality television show is definitely a derivative of ballroom, period, point blank. There's always a judges panel. There's always, you know, these challenges. There's always, you know, the experts, so to speak. There's always, you know, commentaries, um, all of those types of things. And ballroom, that's exactly what ballroom is and what ballroom always has been. Um, you know, there is a panel of judges people you don't necessarily know, people who are, you know, deemed as experts in the in the particular categories or the, you know, the the subject matter. And yeah, and you have to kind of prove yourself and then there's an ultimate winner. I mean, that's just basically what it is, right? So, um, you know, a lot of people have, you know, major conversations about whether or not that's appropriation and all those kinds of things. I tend not to get into those conversations. <laughs> I do have personal thoughts of my own, um, but, you know, for the sake of, of wholeness, um, 
I, I don't really get into those the, those particular conversations, but I will say, yes. So I really feel like most of the reality shows that you see on television are definitely derived from ballroom. I'm, I'm really glad that Legendary is now on HBO Max um, so that people can actually get a glimpse into what ballroom actually is. Um, but it, again, it is just a glimpse. It is not a ballroom in its, its totality, so to speak. So yeah, so yeah, Hollywood is, you know, I mean, you know, and as Legendary even comes on, I will say this though, even as like with Legendary being on and whatnot, um, my thought has always been, if we don't have enough people doing the same things that I'm doing, like if there are not enough icons or legends out there, even having these conversations with like, like I'm having with you all, um, what ends up happening is, is that things start to become a little bit more watered down. Um, especially like, you know, okay, like say for instance, like with Legendary, right? So Legendary is a glimpse into ballroom, but it is not ballroom specific. It is not everything that ballroom is. So what happens is that when that becomes something that's shown on a major platform, there are folks who are not a part of the community who see it and interpret it in their own way, right? So then you have people who are like, oh, I'm gonna throw a ball for my birthday and I'm gonna throw a ball and so on, so on, so. And I'm telling everybody in earshot, everyone that can hear me, if you do not have a legitimate person from ballroom throwing or helping collaborate with you to throw a ballroom function, do not do it. You cannot possibly do it without knowing the ins and outs of ballroom. Please, 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 for your sake and our community's sake, do not even think about it. I think like, just to add on that, you know, legendary, like you said, is the glimpse, but a lot of folks come to it through RuPaul's Drag Race, right? And so they think, <laughs> so that is like their understanding of ball. So love to get your opinion on that. Okay, so I love RuPaul and I love RuPaul's Drag Race, right? I have a very strong opinion about RuPaul's Drag Race, right? RuPaul is a drag queen or what we would call a butch queen in drag, which is a self-identifying gay male who gets into drag, who puts on dresses and performs and entertains people. Queer, <laughs> it is so interesting because there are so many different people who can do drag, right? I am very clear on that. There are trans men who do drag. There are trans women who do drag, right? There are so many, but RuPaul is one person, right? One person representing what RuPaul knows how to represent, which is a boy in a dress, right? Or a, bo a born male in a dress performing and entertaining people. So I personally think that it is preposterous for anyone to expect him, right? Because that's the pronoun, him, to expect him to represent anything else outside of that. And I understand that there is, there are grown, you know, like drag is really huge and amazing, but RuPaul represented himself as who RuPaul is and did not make any kind of excuses for that, right? So when we're talking about trans folks being on that particular show, we're talking about um, you know, uh, cis, cisgendered folks being on the show and whatnot, right? The thing about it is, is that there are amazing trans folks out there. There are amazing, just queer folks, period, who could start their own lane and not rely on poor RuPaul to be the, you know, the, the queen of drag, right? She, yes, she is a queen of drag because of her name and all of that and the notoriety, but at the same time to expect one person, you know, it's like, there are so many other really amazing people that could, they could, there could be a trans drag show there. Could, you know what I mean? Like there's no reason why there can't be, but oftentimes what people will do is they'll use that one figure in order to, you know what I mean? To push all of their different agendas and, you know, and, and start, you know, start their own debates and whatnot, right? And I guess that's what comes with celebrity and all of that. But at the same time, yeah, I mean, I feel like there's room for everybody. And, you know, again, I feel like the individual communities that may have issues or problems with, again, RuPaul, so to speak, um, you know, uh, that's just one show. You know what I mean? Um, Legendary is just one show. There are people who have issues with Legendary and it's not being, you know, it not exposing, excuse me, it not exposing, um, you know, the entirety of ballroom, right? But ballroom has so many different layers. So it's, it, it gets really complex and whatnot. And so I was just using that as an example. I don't know if I answered your question though. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I think like, uh, you know, a lot of the times popular media has gauged what people feel they know about ballroom, right? So either it be through Paris is Burning or TV shows. And so when you think about like something like Pose um, as well, also in the mix and like RuPaul's Drag Race, like this is our, our way of engaging 
Um, and so I think folks are interested in how they can like respectfully engage, right? And respect. Right. So they're really, I mean, again, it's it's really all about Googling. You know, um, there's a really great station on YouTube called Ballroom Throwbacks. Um, they have been around forever. They have millions and hundreds of millions of views and all of that. And they essentially go to all of the different balls and what, and um, you know, and record the different, uh, you know, the activities going on and all of that. Um, and so even back to the whole RuPaul Drag Race. So there's certain terminology that RuPaul's Drag Race has, you know, that they have um, birthed, so to speak, you know, out of, you know, inspiration of ballroom, right? Like when a person actually goes into a dip, which is the formal word for, um, you know, a, a, a voguing term, right? Well, on RuPaul's Drag Race, sometimes they say death drop or they'll say shawam or shablam and all of that, right? Well, shablam is kind of like the sound you make when you actually do a dip wrong and you hit the ground and it's just like kind of like a splatter. So it's like shablam, right? Um, and then when they say a death drop or whatever, it's like because people, you know, feel like, okay, when you're falling back, it's like, you're di you know, you're, you're dying. So, you you know, you're doing a death drop or what whatnot, right? So, you know, and people get really upset about that. Sometimes I do watch the show and I'm like, okay, if you guys are, you know, why do you keep saying these terms from ballroom, but they say them so much and they're so publicized that they actually degrade the value of the word or why they were being used. Right. Um, a prime example is that I have a song. It's called "Let Me Call This Bitch." Right. Um, and basically, when reality television, like The Housewives of Atlanta and shows like that, started, um, it was interesting because what I found is is that they were cisgender women and they were saying all of the phrases that we say. Right. All of the phrases that us young black and brown folks in our community have either gotten killed over, you know, bashed over, bullied, beaten up, all of that. And these cisgender women are now on television, and they're like, "Oh, Miss Thing, honey, and boots, and girl." And da, 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 you know, and work and all of that kind of stuff, right? Now, um, and so it was, and they had no association with community at all, right? They may have just had gay friends or whatnot, right? Um, whereas there's the flip side of that, where there also are people like, you know, say for instance, like a Tyra Banks or, um, you know, a Naomi Campbell or somebody who, who traditionally within their field of work, they have always been around, you know, the us underground ballroom, um, you know, participants and gay folks, right? So it's like, you know, of course, so that's a regular conversation for them. That's how we would, you know, would talk just, you know, and lingo back and forth. But those are folks that are actually accepted into the community, so to speak, or have a place in community who have been, who have shown support, all of those kinds of things, right? So once you see, start seeing these random people, um, you know, saying these different things, it's just like, well, wait, who are you, you know, where, at what point did you, yeah, how did, you know what I mean? And it's like, it's become their catchphrases, right? Um, so the whole premise behind the song was basically calling each each one of them out pretty much on, you know, and just letting them know that I want my phrases back, right? You know what I mean? So, so it's like, let me call this bitch and be like, hey girl, look, um, I need you to stop saying that, or you know what I mean? So that's how it came into effect. Um, we have a new mix coming out uh, for my birthday. We have a special uh, mix that's coming out in June. Um, which will be really, really cool and fun. Uh, but yeah, that's just, you know, it's just, it, 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 and it's getting really, it's getting a lot harder. I will say it is getting a lot harder for us as ballroom folks to actually control it, right? Because um, they just brought Jack Mizrahi on as, you know, the executive, one of the executive producers for um, Legendary, right? He wasn't on the first season, but he's on the second season now, right? And he's one of the, like, he's a, you know, world-renowned commentator, all of that, you know, everybody knows who Jack Mizrahi is um, within the house and ballroom scene internationally, um, but he's only one person. Right. So what if someone, what if ABC or this other, you know, these other folks, you know, these other competitive, um, uh, you know, television networks, what if they want to give one, you know what I mean? Or what if they want to do a show, show, a show similar to that, right? How do we, you know what I mean? Like, how do we fit into those plates? You know, how, how do we navigate what ABC does or whatnot? Especially if, you know, I mean, these are multi-million dollar companies and stuff. And so again, I always urge people, I'm like, please, 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 please involve legitimate ballroom folks in all of the work that you're doing, especially when it comes to, um, on, a, on you know, when, it, when it's something on a large public platform, uh, especially like television and stuff, it's so important because otherwise, I mean, it kind of just, you know, will be like disco. You know, I mean, everybody will be doing a disco song and then pretty much everybody say, oh, that was a fad, you know, kind of like when Madonna did Vogue and whatnot, you know, it's like, oh yeah, nobody really does that anymore. And it's like, no, there are kids that are doing this every day, all day in, you know, every part of the world. Um, 
even before, you know, Madonna was doing Vogue, you know, there was Queen Latifah uh, with Coming to My House, you know, there was Malcolm McLaren who did a whole album deep in Vogue about the ballroom scene and the different categories in ballroom. Um, you know what I mean? Jody Watley, you know, I mean, there were so many di other different people uh, before Madonna was doing Vogue, but because it was on such a national platform and an international platform, I should say, um, you know, cute song, you know, but it was just that kind of situation where it just kind of blew it out the water. And then people were like, okay, once I'm tired of hearing the song, then the, uh, the tradition is done, right? Um, so that's why it was like even really important for myself and Carla Gordon to work with ACTA the, um, uh, to get uh, voguing uh, you know, known as a traditional art form in the state of California. Um, I'm wishing and hoping and praying that we can do that you know, further out and just have that you know, eventually become an international um, traditional art form. Um, but it definitely, you know, it, you know, we have our traditions and stuff like that. And so um, oftentimes it's hard to keep it under wraps because we are so Hollywood paparazzi and, 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 and fabulous. You know what I mean? Everybody's like an A-type personality, no shade. You know what I mean? Like it's, you know, and so everybody is a star in ballroom, right? So now that there are these TV outlets, like how do we actually, you know, navigate that and control that? I just ask a really quick, very small follow up, which is, can you say something more about the international scene and is there um, connections uh, between these scenes together? Yes, so definitely. So a lot of the international houses basically started um, uh, with the permission of an actual house that either was founded in New York. I mean, most of the houses, yeah, like we have a few original houses here in Los Angeles um, or on the West Coast, I'll say, or that started on the West Coast. Um, but for uh, traditionally, you know, basically, you know, like, because sometimes there are a lot of people from the, you know, international, like London and Paris and, you know, even Berlin and Russia, they would come to New York for these different balls or whatnot, right? And so they would participate and all the way from Russia, all the way from Japan, you know, we have so-and-so, you know, and they walk the categories and, and whatnot. And so then the houses would get familiar with who these people are and, you know, you know, create a bond, friendships, all of that. And they would go back to their countries and they would be stars in their countries because they came to America and they walked the, you know, the latex ball or something like that, right? Um, and then, you know, it just, it's, just, it's kind of like this trickle down, kind of effect and they would gain their own families and whatnot. But traditionally, most of the houses that are on the, um, that, are, that are international are uh, an extension of another house. Like as Garçons, we have a, you know, a branch in London, we have a branch in Paris, you know, it's that kind of situation. Um, and uh, the other houses are expanding in that way as well. And, and do they maintain the similar traditions and structures of the balls that, as you've been talking about how important it is to, to be deep involved in that way, do they maintain those structures? Do they become quite different? No, I would I would say about ninety to ninety five percent do. Um, some kind of fall astray uh, because they are not in they're not in places that are accessible to uh, like the correct formats or the information or the education, right? So yeah, but but ninety five percent because see you could have a legend or an icon just show up in your city one you know just traveling whatever other work ventures they may have and this oh it's a ball and they go to the ball and they be like what are you guys doing over here? This is insane, right? And then, you know, all it takes is a couple phone calls or a couple, you know, posts on Facebook. And what are they doing in Istanbul? Like, you know, what the hoops, you know, that kind of situation, right? Um, and so then it's easily corrected. And then oftentimes the folks who are working with them to correct those things become more so kind of like founders of that particular scene in that particular country, right? So, yeah. But yeah, they pretty much stick, they, they stick to the guidelines in the room. <laughs> Thank you. That's amazing. I guess uh, like last question or, or Mary, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I just wanted to remind people of the Q&A function. If you're in the audience listening and you want to throw out a question, go ahead and type it in and we'll ask it for you. Um, and I will hand it over to Professor Crawford. And while she asks her question, just be typing. <laughs> Yeah, I just like uh, always want to know what do you think that that we could learn about the possibilities that are created in ballroom and just through like black queer life and black and brown queer life, um, kind of like chances, the creation, you know, like even though like you talk about a lot of times we know these terms are taken up, but there's just like always a creative spirit of keeping going, um, mm -hmm. you know, making a chances and spaces where possibly no one thought this should be, you should exist in spite of like, you know, death, whether through illness, through hate, like what are, what are things that we can learn as a society from ballroom? 
Um, hmm. I'm like, what are the things we can learn? Um, exclusive. I'm not. Ex, I'm not. Excuse me. I'll just say exclusivity, honey. <laughs> That's for the fab girls in ballroom. You know, we're very exclusive. No, I'm kidding. Um, actually, inclusivity um, is is very. Uh, it's one of the lessons that people can learn. Um, ballroom is a place for everyone, um, no matter what your shape, size, gender, sexual preference, whatever the case may be. Um, uh, for some reason or another, people come to ballroom and are always able to find some type of home. Um, and uh, a safe space and a supportive space, right? Um, if you're not being supported by another house, because you're in one house with your, you know, your 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 own house is definitely supporting you, right? Or your friends are supporting you, or you're around a lot of like-minded in individuals, right? Um, there's a lot of opportunities in ballroom, and there are a lot of creative, cre just amazingly creative people. People working with what they have in order to achieve something better, not only for themselves, but for the, you know, for their communities around them. Um, it's really, really important to understand that, um, you know, everybody doesn't have access and what ballroom has done with the access that they have had and, and, and what it, you know, what we are now um, realizing for ourselves um, is just as important and just as effective as anything anyone else is doing, um, especially when it comes to community work and community support, when it comes to visibility, um, all those types of things play an important role um, for these young people who are actually working within the community or walking within the community, you know what I mean? Um, you know, some people feel like ballroom is, you know, a different, is a, uh, is, uh, you know, an extracurricular activity and true, it is for some, right? Um, but when I first started, um, even when I was working at Reach LA, um, I lost a boyfriend and um, a couple of uh, family members, uh, not to death, but just because I had chosen to um, uh, volunteer for Reach LA. Right, and they were like, "Well, you're wasting all your time over here, and da, 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 and why are you doing this?" And they're not going to really take anybody from ballroom serious, and this, that, and the other, and da, da da da. And here we are, 15 years later, right? And here I am, 15 years later, right? Um, and being able to utilize every opportunity that I received in ballroom and made it something much bigger for myself. Um, and I feel like every young person that I'm around, um, they cannot help but pick up on that and learn from that. Um, and I have no problem with helping. Them get there uh, again they told me wasn't nobody wasn't no kid from ballroom gonna ever work in no hiv field it wasn't gonna do this and you weren't gonna do that and all of those kinds of things um and i've somehow managed to do all of it um and i'm still doing more you know what i mean <laughs> so um yeah uh resilience all <laughs> resilience and um visibility and I, I mean there's so many different things I mean just to be able to have a creative outlet and all of that um, you know ballroom provides that for everyone so yeah uh, do we have any uh, other questions folks or no not okay I was just want you to like plug where we can find you uh, yeah. sorry sorry oh. professor um, there there are two questions in the q a oh, yes. yeah yeah uh, one of them is what types of resources and programming are available through Reach LA for high school students, whether it's for educational purposes or connecting students through uh, the coming out process. Thank you for sharing your legendary iconic presence with us today. Oh, wow. Thank you. Um, so Reach LA does a variety of different services. Uh, they have a they have, they have a trans they have a trans program for transgender um, uh, folks. They also have they do HIV testing and counseling. Um, they I'm trying to do this like really quickly. Uh, they actually have discussion groups, a weekly discussion just weekly discussion groups. So you can always go to reachla.org um, to to um, you know access the types of programming that they have. Uh, they have a really cool Instagram, and they're really big. Um, love Miguel. Shout out to Miguel Buhanda, who's the um, executive director there at Reach LA. Uh, but yeah, they have a they post almost every day about all the different stuff they have going on, and it's a wide variety of things that they do. They have a voguing class as well for those who want to learn how to vogue. Um, Father Jamari um, Balmain is actually uh, the teacher who was one of the winners on uh, the show Legendary, uh, so he has a very, very credible source uh, to learn voguing from. Um, and what else were we asking? <laughs> see whether it's for education connecting students through the coming out process 
Right. So um, they do have programs. Like I said, they have discussion groups and whatnot um, that really assist young people in doing all of those things. So I would definitely recommend, um, especially when it comes to health services and those types of things, um, to go to Reach LA. And then the LGBT Center is really amazing as well. Um, it's a little difficult during COVID to get to have access to them. I would say Reach LA is a little bit more accessible. Um, but at the same time, the LGBT Center is really amazing as well. So we'll put a link, we'll, we'll link to them on our Instagram, it's CTSJ at, uh, at CTSJ Oxy, and however else, and when we send out the video for this, we'll, we'll put links in as well. Cool. All right, that's great. And there's one more question. Um, it's, what have, um, what have you learned? I did not wear my glasses. That's a mistake. What have you learned from the newest or emerging forms of ballroom you've seen in 2021 or recently? Um, what have I learned? Um, I've learned that the newer generations are definitely, um, uh, they are definitely resilient. Um, they are now like we've, you know, the House of Art, we actually sponsored a couple of balls last year, uh, which were virtual balls or whatnot. But then they also, the young folks, they started doing balls on Bego um, and really hitting the international scene. Now there's like, it's almost, it, it reminds me a little bit of the Kiki scene, so to speak, but at the same time, not discrediting it. Um, you know, so they have like their whole, uh, you know, they have staff statuses and, and whatnot that they're giving out to different people who have been prevalent during this COVID situation, um, you know, um, as far as ballroom. And one of the, uh, shout out to Pink Escada. Uh, Pink uh, was just named legendary for runway because he's normally walking that particular category all the time on these Bego balls, right? Now for me, Bego's a little crazy because it got a lot of little emojis and all this kind of stuff. And it's just really, really busy. So I can't really concentrate on the actual ballroom aspect of it. But somehow or another, this younger generation has managed to be able to do that and give like these different virtual balls and, um, and really be successful at it, to be honest with you. Wow. Yeah. Outstanding. So they're like, if we can't, even if we can't go outside or we can't go to an actual ball, you know what I mean? Like, you know, uh, we're going to, we're going to create one online and stuff. So you'll see them doing different categories. And then also too, just so everybody knows, uh, the House of Art will be coming up with a ballroom series of our own as well. So please check that out. Um, I'm just waiting to get out of this pandemic and stuff, you guys, so I can really get out and reach the people and talk to the people because I'm all about producing amazing events. And uh, we, we are really planning on doing some great stuff out there in the world, you know? So what's the number one place people could come? Like, is there a web, do you have a, your own website or someplace? Yeah, come? so it's the house, of, so it's the house of art.org. So it's the house of awt.org. Um, and yeah, you'll, we have our, our um, and then it has links to our Instagram, all of that kind of stuff. You can see the different types of work we do. People can see how to donate um, because we are basically an organization funded by artists right now at this particular point. Um, we're still in our in year two for ourselves. Um, and so until we can actually get into that grant qualifying process, um, you know, we've just been supported by actual individual artists. And I want to thank all the artists who have supported us because they've been really amazing. Outstanding. Amazing. Well, thank you so you much. Question, Claire? I believe you had something. No, no, that was that was all I was going to say. Make sure you plug yourself so you tell us. Oh yeah, absolutely. So yes, and then also I'm Sham. And then I have my own Instagram and all that. I'm Shyamalan on every platform. It's S E A N M I L A N. Um, it's my handle on Instagram, Facebook, um, all of that stuff. Um, and I think my number is even listed. I'm just one of those people. It's just kind of like whatever, you know. Sure, it's crazy people in the world, but I can always block you, right? <laughs> but anyway, yeah. So um, yeah, it's Shyamalan across the board. So you can just reach me everywhere. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Professor Crawford, do you want to take us out? Yeah, thank you for being here. Thank you for all for joining our ballroom series. It's been great to wrap this up with Shyamalan, uh, the Garcon, and thank everyone for coming out. See you next Thursday as we continue with The Matrix. Thank you Bye, so much. Bye, everyone. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Bye, everybody.